request size. It's the power one. I could have a one meg file, uh -huh. one gig file. I do one byte at a time, or I do 64k byte. Those are two different stories. Two different stories. So they really need this the request. Request, right? yeah. Not the size of the file. Correct. Mm. Now the and size of the file can help us in determining block sizes. Okay, so if I have a file system with lots of little files, I go with small block sizes. If I have a file system with a few large files, I go with large block sizes. But that doesn't have anything to do with these tracks. No. Okay. Now, large files hopefully are doing large I.O. So when they get into a file system that has large files, it's still up to the application to make sure that it's doing the proper request size. Mm -hmm. And again, all that goes back to PAR. Are you going to teach us what's the information we need to look at part for that? Yeah, we'll come back to it. Now, we did it yesterday, too. We looked at read and write. We looked at the record sizes. So we even plotted it with SPV yesterday. It was saw 4K byte, 8K byte. We were looking at all the par request sizes. But I'll show you again. Okay. Okay. Now, um, we need to spend more time on analysis, and that's that's fine with that question, because that does go into analysis. But here were the statistics that uh, Warren has sent. D does it help to have the front light on or off? Oh, for this, yeah. off. Okay. Off? Mm -hmm. okay. Now they have, you've got the back side of your sheet shows the, the layout. They have two. Uh, logical file systems, XLV2 and XLV0. And they're both striped and mirrored. Okay, so on the back side of this, the uh, XLV2 is a three stripe groove with a stripe unit of 256. So if I take a look at that, 256 times three drives in the groove gives me a 768 block or times 512 gives me a request size of 393k so that file system the best optimized request size into that file system would be 393216 okay so I was just taking not what's window here. Let me just try that again. So we were looking at this file system and I was computing the group size of 3, strike unit size of 256. We got that in terms of uh, bytes that that thing is designed for. Uh, I should be looking at the other file system. Go back now. And the reason I should be looking at the other file system is because there's more I.O. going on in it. So I've got to pick the right file system. I also got to pick the right time interval to make sure that my uh, application of concern and typical I.O. is occurring during that interval. This one had a total of 174,181 stripe operations, whereas this one had over a million and a half. But I'm just taking the first one because it was first in the list. Normally, you would pick the biggest one. So we had 174,000 stripe operations to that, and the total number of stripe units that were moved around was that. Now, this file system is reading more than writing. So there's the total number of read operations, there's the total number of write operations. Same, the other one has writes higher than reads. We're writing more than reading in the other one. And also the number of blocks. The block sizes are also larger. So this XLV2 is a read over write. This one is writing more than reading. And this one looks like it's doing large writes. Okay. So I've got two different file systems with two different characteristics going on in them. 
looking at that 174,000 stripe operations, we then break them down into what we see. And it doesn't matter to me, but twice our largest I.O. request size was nine stripe units. And we're configured as three. But when it only happened twice, I'm going to ignore that. Down here, also nine stripe operations, but that occurred 78,501 times. Now this is a different stripe unit size because, or not actually it isn't. The stripe units are the same, it's just the stripe width. The group size is different, seven instead of three. So anyways, I would ignore that one because it only happened twice. Then looking at all the other requests, of the 174,000 requests, we've got some that were aligned, some that were unaligned. Aligned means that the first I.O. went to the first disk in the Stripe group. Now if I have lots of little requests, they will go unaligned. I have to go over a certain size before I actually start getting the alignment, boundary alignment restrictions. And the MakeFS man page will describe that. So of that interval, a line less than stripe with 624, don't really care, 36 and 58 are pretty small. So the, the biggest one of that one was we were aligned, but we did not match the stripe geometry. And that happened 75,000 times, uh, you know, less than a, maybe a third of the total. And then the other group here now was unaligned and also not stripe, matching stripe width. So that's the one that's occurring most of the time. And these are mostly reads. So I've got 96,000 versus 75,000. So I'd, I'd sit tell myself that that probably means that I'm doing smaller files that are hitting the unalignment situation. But there are some that are large enough to, to make alignment kick in, but I'm not matching the geometry very well. The other one, Largest I.O. stripe size was nine units, and that was 78,000 times out of one and a half million. So again, like the other one, the biggest numbers were unaligned, doesn't end on stripe unit, or aligned, and doesn't end on stripe unit. Is now, there any way this could come out and suggest better values? No. And again, when you have a diversity of I.O. requests, you can't keep everybody happy. If it was a satellite surveillance system with a predictable I.O. stream into the same file system, I should be able to hit a line equal much better. But it's the diversity of the, the use of the file system. And this is where you consider segregating file systems. But I still, at this point, would want to know the name of the applications that are doing the I.O. I can get that from accounting data. Pick the top I.O. ones and then get into their PAR trace to find out more about the nature of their I.O. So this is simply telling me whether I am concerned or not. And actually, this isn't telling me whether I'm concerned or not because I.O. wait time is the ultimate metric. If I don't have anything waiting on I.O., if SAR-D and other metrics look healthy, I'm not going to worry about this. And by the way, on Warren's machine with SAR-D, the wait times are typically 65 milliseconds, which was borderline to me. I'd like them 40 milliseconds or less. And 15 millisecond difference is, is tolerable in my mind in terms of uh, allowance. But if it was in the minutes or something, then I would be concerned. So I gotta make sure I'm looking at the right interval with the right applications and profiling this stuff. But we're talking about stripe geometries, and this is telling me how well request sizes are matching the stripe geometry. Can you repeat that about aligning and Let's take a look at the man page. Unit option is used to specify the stripe unit for a RAID cabinet. 
by the way, everything we've been talking about right now has been mainframe striping. If you've got a RAID cabin, that's already got its own stripe geometry configured to it. So when I mount them, I want to specify my stripe unit and stripe width. For example, recently somebody was uh, working with the, the new uh, uh, TP disk drives. And uh, the documentation says to use the stripe unit geometry that that drive is configured for. So when you mount it, you want to use these two options. But what we're saying here is the stripe unit size ensures the data allocations will be stripe unit aligned when the current end of file is being extended and the file size is larger than a 512k byte. Okay. I know it's an internal logs are always stripe aligned. So they're always on the first stripe unit within the stripe group. And some of that is also going to be explained. That was for a RAID. Dash, dash D option. SAR gave him an average weight of 2,451 on one of the disks. 2,451, that's two seconds. Is that in milliseconds? That is in milliseconds. Yeah. There's no one twenty seven hundred. And if that only occurred once a day occasionally, that would not be a concern. It's a matter of how often that's occurring. So anyways, based upon our file size, or, or, or where were we? I node allocation. Yeah, right there. When our file size gets larger than 512k byte, uh, alignment is going to start kicking in. And the I nodes and the logs are already aligned. So when we have lots of little files, we generally don't want alignment because we want to try to spread them across the drives a little bit better. But when I get into large sequential I.O. such as a video stream or something like that, I want to align everything to the first drive and try to just push everything out to the drive in parallel. But with smaller files, I'm going to have alignment turned off. So the, the changeover point was 512k byte. So again, striping is for large files, but it also requires the application to do large I.O. request sizes. Let me just see where we are in the workbook. We're just talking about, we, there are other slides doing what we've just talked about, but we were talking about disk striping for potentially greater performance. And we went through the example where, in that example, we had a 3% drop because we could not exactly match a whole friendly power two number. So that's what we mean by potentially. Uh, XOB, take advantage of XFS journaling. GR, I'm just going to get through these slides. GRIO again is a guaranteed right a, rate IO concept. What you're doing here is you actually take a real-time sub volume and then you measure the bandwidth on it. Then the real time, there's a guaranteed rate I.O. daemon that runs. It builds a reservation table for my disk bandwidth. And when I run an application, I can reserve out of that bandwidth and therefore get some sort of guarantee. So I measure my file system and says there's 100 megabyte capacity of bandwidth there. And then I run an application. The application can say reserve 50 megabyte for me. That's what I need. And then somebody else can come along and reserve the other 50 megabyte. So it's a reservation concept, kind of like a restaurant reservation system again. If the, res if the bandwidth isn't there, then I've got to be able to decide what to do. Now there's no guarantee, there's no hard guarantee. Okay, we're simply taking a bandwidth and carving it up and reserving it out. If, for example, my GRIO partitions were on drives that had other partitions doing things, then I can't take it. I, I don't know about those things. So when I measured my bandwidth, if the other partitions weren't active, I didn't get a realistic number. So it's possible that GRIO is overestimating the true bandwidth. But it's used quite a bit in the video market and media base is one example of it. Anyway, also XOVs gives us plexing, which is for data protection. It's protecting the data. We can it requires a license. We can have up to one plex with three copies of it. It requires a license for the three copies. OK, 
Okay, so the first plex is not actually protected. It's when I create the second plex that I have mirroring. And also XOV has online reconfiguration capability, the ability to take a plex offline, try to recover what you can off the plex, and then add a new plex into it. Particularly if you're hot swapping disk drives or have spare disks or spare disk space that you can throw on the system. So this is just showing how a file system was put together. We have a volume. In this case, we were looking at XOV0 and XOV2 in Warren's case study. And then out of that, we have the sub-volume. That's kind of a typo there. But we have a data sub-volume. We could have a log sub-volume, and we could have a real-time sub-volume. When I make the file system is when I determine that. And then we create the plex. And in this case, we've got the plexus on S1B2 and S1B3. And in this case, our data is on this plex, and the mirror is on this plex. The last number then, there, then, is the mirror version. So if I had three copies of it, I'd have dot zero, dot one, dot two, dot three. And we were looking at that with uh, Warren's example, where he had one that was three wide and then plexed, and the other one was seven wide, but the, the way it was put together was funny. Because they go seven wide, but then they plex it off the three wide in both cases. Looking at the uh, back example. And I'm assuming those are different disk drives. Di different disk drive uh, sizes and stuff. I'm not sure how it was sliced out. We don't get the partition size information. While well, we do get the blocks, you can see they are larger. Anyway, so XLB make is the command that does this now. Again, this is replaced by the XVM command with CXFS. I thought, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. But I thought that um, it was in this case, these are the volume element for this flex. As you're mirroring, you would have that at that one, which would be the other flex. Oh, these were concatenated together. Right. So yeah. It's, I don't know you're right. Wrong. I got the uh, two backwards. Okay. So these are concatenated. There is no actual flex in that example. So with XLV make or XVM, they're very similar in syntax. You specify your volume name, you specify whether you want a data sub-volume or a log sub-volume or a real-time sub-volume, and then you specify the, how you're gonna to put together the plex and specify any volume elements that you want to add into the plex and an int and a show. And we were using XLV, uh, I'm sorry, disk align to create XLV make syntax a little bit earlier. So this is just reinforcing that we can have a single disk volume, we can have a concatenated volume, we can have up to 128 volume elements to put together that file system, and we can also do striping. And here they are doing showing flexing. Where we've got uh, two different uh, volume elements put together there as a flex. There is any restriction in the number of data that you can have for volume elements? There are restrictions, but with XVM, the restrictions are much, much higher. I mean, there's always a finite capacity, but XVM has much higher limits. So you can uh, have a lot more slices to put together your file systems. Anyways, uh, when I get to a system, I usually have to deal with what's already there. And a lot of sites do not want to change the file system configuration because that means service interruption. They've got to dump things. If they've got 300 disks, there's a lot of shuffling around there. And again, in this example, this slide, all I'm trying to talk about is the fact that drives have different characteristics to them. The CK drives have a little bit lower crossover, and they're better at random access and small I.O. And the IBM drives have a little bit higher crossover and are better at large sequential I.O. And RAID devices would even go beyond that, having larger sequential access. Now, there's a product called BDS. This is for NFS servers or for data delivery of large files. So compute server sites will use BDS. And BDS is a layer on top of NFS. It does two things primarily. It bypasses file system buffer cache. So it's doing direct I.O., which means there's less, less shuffling of data around. We don't have to move it into kernel buffers. And also it's upping the transfer size. Okay. 
So doing a larger transfer size at a time means the BDS is designed for large sequential transfers. Now what a lot of sites will do is they'll generate their data in a slash scratch file system and then move it into a slash archive file system that's NFS mounted and then DMF running on that particular NFS server. And then they'll use BDS to get it off of their server onto the NFS server. And in the same time, having uh, DMF keep lots of headroom would avoid fragmentation. So when they copy it to that slash archive file system, hopefully there's lots of headroom on that file system. I don't know what uh, Janet teaches, but 70% is where I like to keep my file systems. You were probably 80. I haven't given actual number of recommendations. I've just okay. gone over what should limit. Sure. So DMF is trying to keep a target range. I, I like to see it between 70 and 80. And when I get to a site that's 98% full, I want to first of all make sure that scrubs are done, that files that don't need to be there have been scrubbed off. Otherwise, they have to put up disk quotas or something like that, or else add more disk space. So anyways, BDS is really designed for an application that's generated its data on a local scratch file system and then is moving it into a uh, cluster file system or a common point that other people can get to that file. For example, I may crash a car and then the next day 15 other users will evaluate what that simulation looked like. And again, XFS should be twice the bandwidth desired of the BDS file system, that's the recommendation. Again, I was talking about the, this crossover being whether I'm a transfer-dominated or a seek-dominated situation. Low crossover drives you want for the seek domination. High crossover drives you want for the transfer domination. The higher the crossover, the better for large I.O. And that's what I've been trying to stress. Also keep in mind that you can saturate your SCSI channels before you actually hit your bandwidth. So I.O. operations per second. A lot of the database markets goes to fiber channel because I can sustain a higher IO operation per second on that interface. Okay. So SCSIs, you may say it's, it's a 40 megabyte per second SCSI, so I put four drives there, each can handle 10 megabytes. But then you don't achieve that because you're spending your time in uh, initiating the IO, doing the operations, the handshake going on, rather than actually doing the transfer. Also, in that scenario, this is where I can see command tag queuing being helpful. Command tag queuing is configured on the other side of the SCSI interface. And if my SCSI is full, basically I can get the IO operations through the opportunities or the open windows on the SCSI interface and queue them up on the other side of the SCSI. So if I am saturating my SCSI with IO operations, I get these IO operations through opportunities in the uh, SCSI interface where there's nobody using it, queue them up on the other side, and then they can get done. The way you basically set your command tag queuing depth is to take like 96 and divide by the number of disk drives that you've got on that particular SCSI. That way you're getting an equal balance of queue lengths across all these SCSI drives there. Does that include the uh, external device or just the disk? Well, this would be all the SCSI, all the disk drives that are on an individual SCSI. Okay, and I'm not talking fiber channel. Fiber channel uses a different number. So if, I, if I've got four drives deep on my SCSI, I take 96 and divide it by four, and that'd be a good starting point for my command tag queuing depth. And the FX command allows me to set that, as well as turn it on or off. So I'll, I'll just going back to the main concept, when I do get saturated SCSI channels, particularly due to IO operations, command tag queuing can help me. And I basically want to set the depth of the command tag queue on each disk to be a certain number divided by the number of disks there. And 96 is what you use for the SCSIs. That's where you see like IO error, SCSI IO error in the syslog or no? Well, I, the, the SCSI IO error could be a variety of different things where command failed or there was a media problem or some sort of other problem on the disk drive. You do want to try to resolve those errors if they're occurring all the time. But there are different types of SCSI errors that can be occurring. Now that is one difference, by the way, I should probably mention right now. The uh, disk drives also have hardware caches within them. You have the ability of turning that hardware cache into a buffer instead of a cache. 
So you can do write buffering. But the disadvantage is, is that if the, when I do the I.O. into the buffer, I get an I.O. done right away. If the buffer is then flushed to disk and there's a media failure, I've got a bad sector, I don't know who initiated the I.O. request. So I can't tell who the I.O. error was for. So a lot of people use command tag queuing, which is kind of like queuing things up on the drive and helping it, instead of write buffering. Because command tag queuing, I know whose request it was. I've tagged it. And then I can get the X error status back to me more correctly to the person that is initiating the I.O. So rate buffering, you lose it with command tag queuing. You just have a tag to get back to the process to tell that you had an I.O. error. Okay. So a lot of sites do not advise write buffering because of their fail-safe situation. But it would help writes faster if I was writing large files. But that's a reliability trade-off I have to make. Let's just go on with the workbook here. So anyways, XFS, the data sub-volume is required. The log sub-volume is optional. We talked yesterday about whether to put it on a separate drive or not. The, the recommendation here is based on small drives. This is a five, six-year-old slide. And then real-time sub-volumes are optional, and they should be on a separate drive. And that separate drive should be a high crossover drive, and it's usually where you would use striping, whereas the data sub-volume might not stripe and then use the real-time sub-volume as your stripe. And keep in mind with zone bit drives, if you're going to break them up, that you want the large data on the outer tracks and the log on the inner tracks. And we talked about that yesterday, the fact that the log would be better at the end of the drive than the beginning of the drive. And I generally don't advise striping root or user because the nature of the I.O., there's lots of little I.O.s. Our uh, root can be plexed, and you put that on a different device so that if your device fails, you've got the uh, physical hardware path to the device that's your backup. The second bullet is no longer true. Dual hosted volumes can't be plexed. They can't now. In fact, that's where we've now gotten into CXFS. Okay. Now, plex volume on this should have the same address range. And it talks here about concatenating volume elements into a single plex because if a plex partition goes bad, the whole volume element has to be taken offline. And we've already talked about this now. Don't stripe root or user. Applications using stripe file systems should be doing direct I.O. If I'm doing I.O. through buffer cache, then buffer cache is going to change the geometry of my I.O. request on me. Now we're going to come back to this, but FS tab and our mount table can change the attributes for my file system buffer cache. So when I mount a file system, I can say, do small I.O. or do large I.O. But I've got to talk about that story a little bit more. Stripe volume elements should be the same disk partitions. They should be the same size. They should also be the same disk drive type with the same firmware levels and everything. I'm not going to mix them. I also don't like to stripe RAIDs, for example. I don't want to do a mainframe striping of RAID devices. That's what I call a plaid configuration. Now you can do that, but you need a very, very predictable stream of I.O. request going to it. You don't want any sort of diversity in that sort of situation. This is what I was talking about earlier. Each disk involved in stripe volume out should be on a separate controller so that we round robin the controllers rather than go down one SCSI, then the next, then the next. And log cell volume can be striped, but I don't think you'll ever get any performance because the nature of the I.O. is small. Okay, so some people might have striped just out of habit, but it's probably not helping you. And if OSView doesn't show any striping problem or any log problems, I'm not going to worry about it. And home probably striping won't help you much either. Depends upon what they're doing in their home directories. If they do have video movie in their home directory, then they are probably needing striping. Now even on my PC at home, I added a second drive and I put all my video media and all my movie media on that second drive. I keep it off of my root and I keep it off of my home desktop directories in Windows. So it's the same sort of thing. When I installed my video tools, I said use the other drive as my scratch directory to hold all my media. So this is what we talked about before break. The transfers for large requests are split and then sent to each disk in parallel. The step size is the size 
that I'm breaking it up into. So we went and figured out the step size a variety of different ways. We could set it by a known application transfer size. Now we derived that earlier. Let's go back and show you R. As I said, I'd show you that again. So we had a par trace here, I'm going to go into the real WL, maybe I removed them. It was in, uh, was a par there, there's a par out. I was just trying to find one that I ran yesterday, but instead... Site new, under site underscore new. Yeah, that was a part trace for something else, though. Oh, okay. I wanted. I was looking for one for code three. That one was a site one. So let me just uh, see what we got here. Okay, that's a binary one. So par dash little s is going to read my system call traces, and I'm going to read in. I don't know what this part trace is. It was from a site, but let's just take a look at it. Oops. Little s collects it. I wanted the big S. Three big S's is what I want. And then I'm going to grep, in this case, reads. Maybe we'll do, do both reads and writes. And page it. So here are all the read and write system calls that are going on in my system. Now I gotta be careful about what I'm looking at. You name, stuff like that. I don't really care about a lot of that stuff. But here was a read. The third byte or third argument in the read is the size of my request. So when we're asking a customer what's the size of my IO request to decide striping, this is the number I care about. But this is just one number out of a whole screen for you name. And I'm not gonna tune for you name. Okay. I've got to pick the right situation. Now we do have this DB thing going on, and here's a whole bunch of ASCII tests going on. And here again was Uname doing a 512 byte transfer. So I'm just looking through this and seeing what kind of sizes. Here's a 512. Here's a 496. But the actual request size that it did was 1482. So when I in my program I said do a 4K byte transfer but the operating system only did a 1482 transfer. That's because I hit it into file or a null termination. Okay. So this is the main number we care about. This is the size of request that we're actually asking for. But if I'm actually tuning the system and they're all coming up smaller, this is the size of request of the data that I'm typically actually getting done. And that request then is going to be getting get sectorized by buffer cache and come out of the other side of cache with a sector size to it. Okay. And again, there's a whole lot of these. 5, 12, 10, 24, so forth. So I'm going to try something else here now. This is to demonstrate the concept. But SPV plotted those two numbers that I was just looking at. Oh, the name of that file I forgot was cartage.r. So there's a par file example here. So if I've got a, a 10 second sample with 100,000 reads in it, it's hard for me to go through that ASCII trace and see all these numbers. Call it C A T I G E two dot R. And now I'm going to take a look. Let's take a look at that whole trace. So wait sys was one of the main system calls going on in that trace. And calls per second was writes and else. So if it was a system time, wait sys would be what I'm interested in. But I'm just looking at the reads and writes. In fact, in this case, the writes would be more interest to me than the reads, probably. It's like I'm writing more than reading. I also see LSEQ telling me that I'm doing random I.O. positioning into the files. 
So it looks like this particular system has more random writes going on than reads. It looks like it's uh, writing more than reading, but I can't tell if it's small or large I.O. at this point. So now if I go to the next one and take a look at my reads and writes, I can tell what the size of those requests are. That was the reads. Let me do the writes as well. And I'm seeing a wide range of sizes, in this case going up to 64K byte, it looks like. So my writes are in the order of 2K byte and 4K byte. Same. And that's actually what I'm doing too. So this, these two charts are pulling out on the right these two numbers. Okay. So I've gone through that whole trace we were just going through ASCII. I've sorted by name, but the ones that I care about are these. Okay. So this one is what I asked for, and then the, on the right side with the equal sign is what I actually did. Then I can go in and figure out which particular application this is. It looks like CA1 STA, whatever that particular process is. I don't know. Is there a TTA in there, maybe? I don't know. See, the line, the information between, say, the two lines seems to be a bit. This is a time axis, so it's the intensity of the calls. You're talking about the way the spacing is occurring? Uh, no, I'm talking about the fact that there's kind of a, a background there that seems to be a bit hazy. It's not white. Uh, oh, the way this background is working? Yeah. That's white on my workstation. That's just the way it's coming across on the screen. Okay. So just going back to this, what I'm saying is I've got some requests that are in the 0 to uh, 512 byte range. But then on this particular par trace, I'm getting two and four K byte transfers. And that's actually what it's coming back with the operating system is actually doing. And these were writes. So it looks like I'm doing lots of little writes. And the other thing I was saying was this is the time axis, so we can see where there was a whole bunch of writes. And then there was a spacing going on. It could have been uh, creating data, CPU bound, and then doing the IO calls. So there was some, some other time going on between the right system calls being made there. And I don't know what that was. Okay. And we could actually go in with the par trace, by the way, it has when it started and when it ended. So we'd actually be able to see the time between the reads and writes. Uh, the system could have slowed down I.O. wise, and that could have shown up the same thing. Where we had a whole big burst of I.O. queued up, then we st stalled for a little bit, and then we caught up again. I can't tell that from this particular trace. The other one was the reads, and the reads are much bigger. So here is 64K byte, and this is a different application. No, it's the same one. CA1STAA. So it's there at 65K byte. There's one right above 64K byte. Okay, and there's a, um, some of these yellow ones too, this DB. DEV0 process. So I've got 64K byte, there's 16K byte, there's 10K byte, but it looks like the system is writing more than reading, lots of little writes, and then there are these large reads that are going on as well. And it looks like the same basic process. So at this point, I would be interested in looking at just the CASTAA and to try to optimize my file system, in this case, for writes with 4K byte transfers. 2 and 4K byte was the typical request size. But again, I'd still go back to the application first and say, can I up the application request size? I don't want to drop everything down to match this if the application can up its request size. If you're running both 2 and 4K right there, would it be better to set your uh, size to 2K? That way the 4Ks would be just duplicates or or would it be okay to set them to 4K? I would, just, I would be designing it for 4K. Or 4K and just yes. or 2K would be just half a buffer. Right. Okay. And that's where some sites may actually uh, segregate the I.O. streams into separate file systems or separate configurations. Or we get, uh, for example, it may be doing 2K bytes and 64K bytes. So the 2K byte goes to the 
uh, data volume, and then the larger one goes to the real-time volume, and we can't see which file systems these are going to. Okay, so a database engine might have different sizes going to different file systems, and that's where we'd like to segregate our traffic if we can. Get our lots of little IOs going into one file system and our large sequential going into a separate file system. So that, anyways, that's how I'm figuring out what the request size is. But SPV is just making it easier for me to see all the data points. The real point was to know this. Okay, so what was the name of that program again? CA1, STAA. Okay. So now I'm going to do a par. So there were a whole bunch of records there. Now I filtered down to the particular application that I want. Now I can see, well, I should have corrected the read to it. is Katia. Or writes. Ah, that is Katia. Yeah. So what is it? That's the uh, car, the modeling program for cars. Yeah. In fact, it shows it right here yeah. from Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Okay. So uh, let's see now. So I was interested in writes more than reads in this particular example. Oops. Oh. So we've got a whole bunch of uh, single byte writes. Majority of them are very, very small, and that's what we've seen before. So here's our 4K byte, and here's it was under 2K byte in this example, 1984. 4K. Oops, I'm sorry, 4K. 4K. So that other tool, SPP, just made it easier for me to see the trends and then to identify specifically what I'm looking at. So rather than camp computing it, the par-s is going to confirm it all. So I'm just going to go back to the workbook now. So that's what I just went through. A known application transfer size, I just took a par trace and figured out what the trends of the application transfer sizes were. So I have to sort out whether I'm reading more than writing and which way, it, what matters to me. So I was characterizing that and already now I saw on that particular example, I saw large reads, I should say a few large reads, and lots of small writes. There were 2K and 4K, and these went up, what was it, 64K, I think it's, for the reads. I don't remember, that's what I remember off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, also, the, by the way, the writes were random because there were L-seeks going on. And we could have looked at that more closely, too. They were L-seek. Now, L-seek could have been rewind. I'd have to actually look at the position I'm seeking. <clears throat> so I could be just seeking to the beginning all the time, or I could be randomly seeking. The other way that we could set the transfer size of the striping was based upon some bandwidth. And that's what most people are doing. They say, I, I need a certain bandwidth, let's just design it for that. So Naval Research Labs designed their file system for bandwidth, striped 128 wide, but then they didn't know anything about their I.O. characteristics for their main applications. They didn't have any R data to make that decision. Uh, it just also says sometimes the geometry question we're trying to match is the geometry of the disk drive, the number of sectors per track and number of tracks per cylinder. When you go into RAID cabinets, that geometry question is what's been configured by the software within the RAID cabinet. So with these RAID cabinets, they'll often have in the owner's manual a recommended request size that that thing has been optimized for. But if you unbind and rebind your logical units, you're going to change the behavior of that RAID cabinet. And again, when you're mounting 
RAID file systems. The FS tab now has strike units and strike width to give XFS an idea of what the RAID cabinet considers a friendly I.O. request. So by default, when XFS boots, it can't ping a RAID device and say, what request size do you like? So when you mount it, you can tell it, this is the request size that I want you to generate to that RAID cabinet. So we went through this example, the strike width was the size of our request, and we figured out the strike unit by taking that strike width and dividing by the number of disks. And making sure that our strike unit is a aligned whole friendly number, we had to be a multiple page size, but we also had to be a multiple block size, the allocation unit size. And this is what I was drawing up up here. Bandwidth can drop off proportional to the transfer size. So you get kind of a sawtooth concept. But caches and software uh, techniques can, uh, adaptive caches and software techniques can hide the effect of that software pattern. Also, when you're striping, there is a system parameter called max DNA size. This is the largest request size that I can move out of my memory. So if that's set too small, if I go 128 disks wide, and this is too small, my IO request is going to get broken up into pieces anyways. So you want to make sure that that's increased larger than your strike width. Okay. Otherwise your request will get broken up into pieces again and now you're spending time handshaking and trying to handle the request rather than actually doing it. So this is just trying to uh, demonstrate the concept that we went through. A four drive system, the strike width being how many drives are there. The strike unit being let's break that request size into four equal steps and set our strike unit to be the size, in this case, one quarter of the request size we're designing for. I'm going to skip over this page. Let's just talk about writes versus reads. So, uh, striping. Stripe volume elements may increase performance. The logical transfer amount is the striping data size, and that's just what we went through using PAR. The stripe size was 512 byte blocks. It's a default of 64K byte, and we already went through that, taking 128 times 512 gave us 64K. And again, build your strike file system symmetrical. So I'm kind of done with striping right now. This slide is just talking about how I want to split out my file systems. And this is where I like the analogy of segregating your I.O. traffic, splitting it out. You're going to split out your file system based upon a couple of different things. Uh, reads versus writes, small versus large, uh, home versus scratch. Also, you may split out your file systems for uh, scrubbing and retention periods. For example, on our system, Home is backed up. I guess backups would be part of that too. Home is backed up. Temp is scrubbed on reboots. P temp is scrubbed every seven days. So you may have your file system split out based upon what kind of policy you say you're going to allow them to keep the file around in that particular file system. And again, what I'm trying to do here is segregate my IO traffic. I guess the other thing then would be to split. I.O. out. For example, home one versus home two. If I've got a thousand people in my data center, I don't want them all in the same file system under slash home. So I may split them out into home one, home two, home three, home four. The bigger the file system, the more I can abuse it. So just looking at some of these typical file systems, roots, it's typically lots of little reads get everything else off a of root as possible. And the user file system is usually the first thing that you want to get off a of root. You also want to get swap off a of root. Okay. Slash user has a whole bunch of things under it, so you've got to be careful. User lib and stuff I don't have a problem with, but user people, for example, I would definitely want to get off of my root device. User spool or var spool. A user temp. A lot of sites split slash op off as a separate file system. That to me was really a sun type of thing, and that's where they put their optional products. 
Now this file system is again usually read of executables, not a write. Okay. Uh, some sites will stripe slash opt, but again, if I'm reading and there's small files, you're probably not going to get any benefit from striping slash opt. The page sizes are going to come in at 16k byte. If I'm reading executables or reading swap files, it's all coming in as 16k byte transfer size. So striping isn't going to help you much there. Var ADM is a write-only file system. A lot of sites will split var ADM off because that's where all my logs are kept and my dumps are kept. I don't want that file system to fill up with, for example, accounting data causing root to fail or causing var spool mail to fail, things like that. In fact, that's why var ADM SAT is often split up. If my security audit directory fills up, I have to go to single user mode. I'm no longer running a secure system. If I can't log it, the only option is to go to single user mode. Now there's an emergency process where when I start running out of disk space, it has some breathing room, but you've got to respond to that problem right away. So I don't want something in bar ADM, like a spam mail attack to cause bar ADM SAT to fill up, causing me to go to single user mode. So if I'm running security software on a mail server, I would want to isolate those directories. Var temp, that's where uh, Netscape does a lot of its work. Unfortunately for me, my home directory on my workstation is NFS mounted, so all the cache data that's in the .netscape directory is still NFS mounted. But at least var temp is on my local system. So the files that I've downloaded are still in bar 10. For example, this is a demonstration right here. I've read through Netscape, so it's sitting in that in the bar 10 right now. Also, some sites link bar 10 to user 10 or to slash 10. So you want to make sure whether that link occurred or not. This directory is usually lots of little reads and writes. Compilers will often work in that directory too. So it's not where you're going to put large sequential like video movies. So if I had installed Adobe Premiere, it gives me the option of where I want my scratch directory. I would not want it in there. I'd want to put it into a slash video or something like that. Var spool has a whole bunch of things in it. Var spool MQ for the mail server. Var uh, spool news for news servers. Okay. You may have a web home directory like var www or something like that. Also in bar school is printers. If my server is just a printer, I want to make sure there's enough uh, disk space for that print stream that I'm doing. That's a problem I have in my data center here. Some of my large documents that I print run out of disk space on the print server itself. So you got to look at bar school very carefully. There's another one that's real important in there is the checkpoint directory. See if I can remember the path here. Bar, uh, spool, NQE, spool, private, root, chkpt. So if I have NQS on my system, I may have periodic checkpointing going on that file system might also be split out and optimized. For example, during a boot or shutdown, I have to checkpoint all my work. So some sites will optimize that file system to make the checkpoints faster. So that might be another thing under var spool that I want to split out. Var ADM crash nobody uses. This is what I call a dormant file system put the dormant file systems onto drives like where the log is or something like that. I could see that if I do want to externalize a log in a particular file system, I could put bar ADM crash in that particular drive. And only the administrator would be one that would be reading crashes from that particular file system. So that's where I may pick my dormant file systems and try to use them on uh, wasted space on a drive, so to speak. User people, I've already talked about splitting that out from slash user, and maybe it's user people one, user people two, or something like that. 
By the way, you don't want your directory to get too deep. Maybe seven, eight years ago in our data center, our home directory was about eight, nine, ten directories deep by uh, you know, department, division, company, state, group, all that sort of thing. So you don't want to get your file systems too deep. Otherwise, you have to traverse a whole lot of directories to get to the data. Slash temp. A lot of people use it a lot of different ways. Typically, slash temp should be a Unix type of thing where I'm just doing my scratch files. But NQS uses slash temp to run all of its work in it. When we've been running our jobs so far this week, they've been all running in slash temp. We have not had any real I.O. going into our home directories. Okay. Those sites that don't want to use slash temp actually create their own directory call like slash work or slash scratch or something like that. And every site uses a different naming convention. When I'm looking at a file system, those are the file systems that I want to look at first, are the production I.O. file systems. So for example, I want to look at Fido.inger, and the main thing that I'm going to look at there would be my bar school news file systems, because that's the bread and butter of INM. And I also mentioned that some sites create a slash archive. This is where I may create my data in slash work, for example, NASRAN, and I'd run single threaded on a single machine, and then stage my data off the system to slash archive where data migration might be running. And then I've got it in, the, in my data warehouse, so to speak, and other people and other systems can get to that data set that I created with my NASRAN. And I always prefer to do I.O., production I.O. to directly attached file systems. I'm not going to make a slash word that's NFS mounted. So that's where I'm going to do my I.O. into a slash word and then copy it into slash archive, which might be NFS mounted or CXFS or NFS with bulk data service. Okay. Uh, NFS was not designed for production I.O. NFS was designed for convenience, being able to put all my home directories on a single machine and then I can do file system backups of them. One of the things that's happened in NFS is as the versions have gotten higher edition numbers, we've upped the transfer sizes. So older NFSs were moving data at 4K byte or 8K byte transfer sizes. Nowadays we're doing it at 16 or 32 where we can even up it from there when we mount the file system. So this IO friendly I.O. request size thing, there's the R size and W size when you mount an NFS file system. And that again gives XFS a clue as to what it considers a friendly I.O. request. Uh, BDS, we can add in here now CXFS. BDS is better for an NFS environment where we don't have the hardware to support CXFS. But we now have a new file system we can add in here called CXFS, which was kind of what we used to call network disks. We have a hardware switch that allows multiple machines to get to the same file system. But again, with CXFS, only one of the systems controls the inodes and directories for that file system. And every other server has to talk to it to say, can I change, can I make this file grow or shrink, or can I create a file or delete a file? So I want to spread my I.O. out across as many drives and controllers as possible. This is where I want to go right now. I want to take a look at machine and look at SAR-D. Okay. So if I have 300 drives, I'd hate to see all my I.O. on two or three of them. Secondly, I want to spread my storage capacity out by disk usage or DF. Disk usage is an accounting command that tells me number of blocks transferred. Or I shouldn't say transferred, but number of blocks stored or allocated on the file system when I looked. So I can charge people. I want to ask myself, is data migration being considered? I might split things out because of that, so that some file systems have data migration and others don't. And do I want NFS or BDS? But again, I try to start off with the file system that is the most important bread and butter application to me. The compute server market is slash temp. On the workstation market, it might be home. It all depends upon the particular market. And this is what I was saying earlier, by identifying my I.O. characteristics, what file systems have unique traits to them. So I've got large sequential, I've got small random, I've got ones that are being read, I've got ones that are being written. My analogy here has been the 
bicycle between two semi trucks on a freeway. I want to put the bicycle in the bicycle path and the semi trucks in the semi truck lane. Has anyone been to Beijing? Beijing, they have no rules of the road. The bicycles are between the semi trucks and they get hit all the time. When I was in Beijing for a week, I saw four people get knocked over by cars because there are more bikes than cars and the cars just knock them out of the way. When you get into the larger areas where, like where the uh, forbidden houses and stuff like that, they then put up fences to keep the bicycles off the main roads. But all the other side roads, the bicycles roll the road. So what you want to do, just like on a freeway, segregate your aisle traffic out. We try to say slow cars to the right, fast cars to the left. Uh, Semi-trucks can't go into the high occupancy vehicle lane. So we're doing the same sort of thing here, split out our IO traffic. And that's where PAR comes in again. Now the thing we didn't see in PAR is we have to see the open of the file to know which file system it's in. So we were looking at request sizes, but we didn't see what file system it was doing its IO into. And that's something that's extremely useful to have, and I don't know of an easy way of seeing that. Uh, lastly, again, I, I talked about if it's database, it's raw, and also do I have backup or retention periods. All those things affect how I split out my file system. Now, we also talked about this, so I just want to review it. This was my block size. When I make the file system, it's the dash B option. Now, these rules of thumbs are old. In the older workstation, we go with a block size of 512 bytes because most of my files are very, very small. As my file systems got bigger and the data that I was working with got bigger, the defaults have also shifted. In this example, they're recommending 2K byte for a news server because my news articles were typically 2K byte or less again. And then for they're going by file systems over 100 megabyte in size go to a larger block size. But really, it's a property of how many files are small versus large. Now, unfortunately, there's no tool that I'm aware of that goes through the file system in iRIC to tell me about lots of little files or large files. What's the statistical nature of the files on my file system? Now, in Unicos, we did with disk usage. So with disk usage, I can run it to say how many files are under 2K byte, how many files are over a terabyte, and then get a population spread of different file sizes. And that is what you really need to set your allocation unit size. Now remember, when I up the allocation unit size, it affects my strike geometry question. I have to be a whole friendly number of this block size. Right? And again, XFS grow up S dash N showed it. The trade-off with allocation size is this fragmentation versus wasted space. There isn't really a data transfer rate improvement. However, going to large block sizes for the name cache for the directory piece using version 2 can help me there. <clears throat> but again, because this is an extent-based system versus a bitmap-based system, a lot of older people would up the allocation in size to think I'm going to allocate faster because there are less bits to manipulate. But now that I'm extent-based, I don't have to go through all that overhead of manipulating a bit for every 512 bytes or something. Okay. So on extent-based systems, it's not directly going to affect your transfer rate. It will affect uh, directory allocation time and stuff like that, though. So if I've got my allocation in small, and I've got a lot of files in that directory or, or long file names, then I'm going to fill up that allocation unit much more quickly and have to allocate more often. In any event, the trade-off is, if I have a file system with a few large files, like a slash video file system, and I pick a small allocation unit, I have a higher chance of fragmentation. So if I'm doing it 5K five, five byte or 4K byte at a time and it's a terabyte file, there's going to be lots of opportunities for me to lose affinity to my file and get fragmented. Now, when I allocate files, they get clo allocated close to the inode. If suddenly I lose affinity, we now allocate to where I left off before. So we try to allocate near the inode, but if suddenly somebody else allocated near me, I find a new allocation space, I will continue from affinity to that new location in the file system. 
I won't go back to try to stick close to the inode. But the thinking being that once I find the inode, the seek time to the actual data would be right there. So if the fragment, if the block size is too small and I have large files, I could have high fragmentation. The other side of the story is if I have lots of small files and I make the allocation unit too big, I end up wasting space. So if I'm in a home directory with one k byte emails all over the place and I go to a 16 k byte block size, I could end up wasting a lot of my disk space, not using all of the allocation unit. Okay. So those are the real trade-offs. An XFS BMAP will show how many pieces that file is and where those pieces are located. 